Hello and welcome to another short data management video. Today we're going to talk about NetCDF files. We're going to talk about what they are and what they can be used for. If you're not familiar with NetCDF files, don't worry. We're going to take it right from the beginning and go slowly. This is going to be the first in a series of videos that I have, which will teach you how to use a NetCDF file, um, how to put data into it and how to take data from a NetCDF file so you can use them. If you are already familiar with using NetCDF files, then stay tuned. Hopefully you can take something from this video too. I'll be talking about some of the best practices and some of the conventions that you should be using when you're creating NetCDF files. So let's jump right in. So NetCDF stands for Network Common Data Form. It's a self-describing file format, which means that it should be understandable without any additional information. So it should have all the metadata and data included within it. It's also a machine independent file format, which means it should be understandable by a variety of different softwares with minimal manual intervention. The standard was initially developed for the atmospheric research community and recording such data in a standardized way has been really useful for the development of weather and climate models. But NetCDF files can be used to store a wide range of other scientific data, wherever you have physical parameters that can be stored on a grid. This standard has been well adopted by the oceanography community, for example. The homepage for a project is hosted by the Unidata program, and I'll put a link to that down in the description. So that's enough background. Let's talk about the files themselves. An NetCDF file consists of three main components. You have dimensions, variables, and attributes. So let's talk about dimensions first. Dimensions define the shape of the data. So you could have a time series of data, you could have a depth profile of data, or you could have a multi-dimensional file where, for example, you have data at different latitudes and longitudes at different intervals in time. So let's consider the last example here. We could have a longitude dimension that states that we have four points of longitude, a latitude dimension that states that we have three points of latitude, and we could have a time dimension that states that we have data from two different times. Note that we haven't said anything yet about what the values of latitude, longitude, or time are. This information is all stored in variables. So we have two different types of variables. We have coordinate variables that define the values for each of the dimensions, and usually the coordinate variable will have the same name as the dimension. And then we have data variables. So variables are essentially arrays of values, and you can use multidimensional arrays if your variable has multiple dimensions. There's different formats that can be accepted for the type of values that you're entering, for example, integers, floats, or strings. So let's consider our example. We have a longitude variable, which has a dimension of the same name, and the values in that array are 28, 29, 30, and 31. We have a latitude variable, and we have three values here, 78, 79, and 80. And we have a time variable. Time is handled a little bit differently within a NetCDF file. Instead of assigning the whole timestamp for each value, you can assign values like one, two, three, and then the units for that variable will be, for example, seconds since a certain time, or days since a certain time, or years since a certain time. We then have our data variables. In this case, I'm imagining that we have seawater surface temperatures. This data variable is going to have three dimensions, latitude, longitude, and time. We can imagine our data to look something like this. But what if we don't have a value at a certain point or multiple points? In that case, we can assign what we call a fill value. So by assigning a fill value, we're explicitly letting the data user know that we don't have data for that point and we can assign the same fill value for every point where we don't have data. The fill value should be an unrealistic value that's going to stand out. So for example, we can use a billion in this case. And the fill value should be explicitly stated within the metadata. Some softwares are actually able to detect that you've used a fill value and they'll remove those values from the data arrays when someone loads the data in. And we can have as many other variables as we want. So perhaps we have the salinity data as well. And finally, we have attributes. So this can be broken down into variable attributes and global attributes. Variable attributes describe the variable, 
So for example, the units, uh, a description for the variable, and perhaps a name for the variable taken from a controlled vocabulary or a standard name. We'll come back onto that later. And then the global attributes describe the data set as a whole. So these are things like the title of the data set, a summary, which is analogous to an abstract in a paper, uh, the maximum and minimum longitude and latitude, some keywords, for example. So now let's have a look at how this actually looks by opening up a file. On the left here, you can see where I've dumped the NetCDF file to text. I've done that using the NC dump utility, and I'll put a link to that down in the description. Uh, but there are a lot of different utilities you can do this for. Uh, the output will be slightly different, but it'll be something like this. Um, and I've just recolored a few things, so it's a bit easier for us to look at. So what we can see is that at the top, we have our dimensions. We have two points of time, three points of latitude, and four points of longitude. Below that, we have the information about our variables. And we can see the name of each of the variables in blue, like this. And then in brackets, we can see the dimensions that each of those variables has. At the start, we can see the format of the values in the variable. And then below, we have some variable attributes. If we scroll down, we can see our global attributes. And there's a long list of things to look at here. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is the conventions. This states what conventions have been used within the file. And we can see the ACDD conventions. That's the attribute convention for data discovery. And the CF conventions, the climate and forecast conventions. We should point out here that the file is not netcdf cf unless you have followed the cf conventions and it is also not fair unless you've followed the cf conventions so the acdd conventions describe what global attributes you should include and how they should each be populated and the cf conventions tell us about what variable attributes we should include we'll have a closer look at these conventions shortly and then if we scroll down further at the bottom in this case we have the data the point that I'd really like to hit home here is that every single NetCDF file will follow this basic structure, and that's a really big advantage. If we see the ACDD conventions listed, we can go to our search engine, type in ACDD conventions, and I'm going to put the version, which was 1.3. And we can see here a change summary, but we're just going to go to the standards themselves. So if I scroll down a little, we can see that there are sections for the global attributes and the highly recommended variable attributes. I'll open up the global attributes. So if the data set has the ACDD conventions listed, most of the terms in the global attributes should be found in this list. There may be some that are missing if the data creator has decided to add a couple of additional terms. So the data creator should have come to this page to select which attributes they should include and also have read the descriptions to tell them how to fill in each of those attributes. So we as the data users can understand exactly what the data creator means by each term. I'm not going to go through each term. All the information is here and I'll put a link down in the description to this page. But I can scroll down to the variable attributes as well. And you can see that these attributes are actually recommended by the CF conventions. But there's a description of them here as well. If we want to look up the CF conventions, we can do that as well. We had version 1.8 here. And there's a lot of documentation that we can see if we follow this link. Again, this is quite thorough. But they cover all kinds of scenarios. So if you're creating a data set and you're not sure how to encode a certain piece of information, you might sign some help in here. One thing that I'd really like to focus on is the standard name attribute. This is a variable attribute that's assigned for each variable. So this should be a commonly used term for a certain parameter. And there's a list of these with descriptions online. We can find that by going to CF standard names, clicking on here. There's all the previous versions here, but we can just select on the HTML link at the top. This is a long list of terms, but it's also searchable. So if we want to type in C 
water temperature, like in our example. We can see a list of standard names that we can select. And it's really important for us to select the correct standard name when we're creating a data set. This should describe exactly what that variable represents. And then someone that finds the data set should be able to understand exactly what the data are. And this is really, really useful. This means that similar data sets with the same data should all be assigned the same standard name. And this makes it very easy for someone to write a script or a program to harvest data from a number of different files from a number of different projects and use them all in the same way. So if we scroll down a little bit further, we have seawater temperature here. We can open this up and read the description. It says here to specify the depth at which the temperature applies, use a vertical coordinate variable or a scalar coordinate variable. There are standard names for the sea surface temperature, sea surface skin temperature, sea surface subskin temperature. So this is telling us that there might be a more suitable standard name in our case where we're looking at the sea surface temperatures. So if we scroll back up to the top and instead type in sea surface temperature, we can look at this here, have a look at the sea surface skin temperature as well, and we can select which one of these is most suitable for our data. We should also look at the units that are suggested here. These are canonical units. And whilst we specify the units in the file itself as a variable attribute, the best practice is to use the units that are suggested. So this might mean in some cases you have to convert your data. So that's all for today. This was a first in a series of videos that I'm going to be doing about NetCDF. In the next videos, I'll talk about how you can put data into a NetCDF file with examples and also how you can get data from a NetCDF file. So if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss those videos. Thanks very much for listening.